euh, James Raleigh, je vais de nouveau le faire en anglais puisqu'en fait j'ai sa biographie euh, en anglais sous les yeux. Euh, James euh, Raleigh is the founder and director of the Image Permanence Institute at Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York, a world leader in preservation research since 1985. Under his guidance, IPI has has made important contributions to image preservation, management of film archives, environmental monitoring and control, sustainable preservation practice. Jim is a consultant to many cultural institutions and is sought after worldwide as a teacher and seminar speaker. He was given a technical achievement award from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science in 1998. He was presented with a Silver Light Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Association of Moving Image Archivists in 2002 and was the first winner of the Hewlett Packard Image Permanence Award from the Society of Imaging Science and Technology in 2007. James, the floor is yours. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd first like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference, to CRCC and CNRS, and especially to Monsieur Bertrand Lavagine for extending me an invitation to speak. My presentation will briefly introduce you to the research of the Image Permanence Institute in the area of environmental management for cultural heritage. IPI, as we refer to ourselves, is a university-based laboratory devoted to preservation of library, archive, and museum objects. IPI today has 18 staff and is supported by grants from US federal agencies, government agencies, from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and by our active program of developing and selling hardware and software tools for environmental management. We have a vigorous consulting practice with many well-known clients, such as the US National Archives, Library of Congress, Smithsonian Institution, and also major architectural firms who build museum buildings. I mention this short description of IPI activities because it is the combination of laboratory research and field experience that shapes our approach to sustainable environmental management. You can see the two halves of our activities, the laboratory and the field practice here. 25 years ago, IPI's research was focused on the preservation problems of imaging materials, photographs, cinema, and microfilm. Examples of such problems were the so-called vinegar syndrome, experienced by photographic film on cellulose acetate support, and as you see here, the fading of dyes in color photographs. We used accelerated aging to understand the nature of deterioration behavior for these materials. We were able to understand such problems mainly as spontaneous chemical change, where the rate of deterioration depended on the nature of the material, and on the prevailing temperature and relative humidity conditions. And here you see the practical results of that work. Uh, this deals with helping uh, archivists understand the progress of the problem known as vinegar syndrome, the spontaneous uh, decomposition by acid hydrolysis of cellulose acetate motion picture film. And to illustrate to you that temperature dependence and humidity dependence. This is approximately the time for uh, fresh acetate film here to uh, begin to be deteriorated via the vinegar syndrome. At uh, 21 Celsius and 50% RH, it's 40 years. And if you use cold storage, as the ISO standards recommend, that same uh, 2 degrees Celsius and the same relative humidity it takes more than 10 times longer. And so we were able to understand these problems, and it was possible to derive the relationship between time, temperature, and relative humidity 
and provide an easily understandable roadmap for archivists so that they may plan storage conditions and manage the environment for these important forms of deterioration. For the dye fading and plastics degradation issues, temperature and RH were the fundamental drivers of decay. Evaluating and managing storage environments for these materials was essentially an exercise in applied kinetics. We also saw that for many other materials and many other forms of deterioration, temperature and relative humidity were likewise hugely important. Not only chemical forms of deterioration, but also purely physical, which you see here in this uh, parchment book cover, uh, as well as biological problems. Biological mechanisms of deterioration were important in environmental management. And all of these were closely related to temperature and relative humidity conditions. Damage caused by light, by air pollutants, and by physical handling depends in large measure on the amount of thermal energy and moisture present in objects. The central importance of temperature and humidity, hardly a new subject in preservation thinking, was the overarching message from nearly all our research on materials deterioration of the kinds that we were involved with. As I have said, we always kept in mind that the goal of the research was to improve the effectiveness of collections preservation. However, it was apparent that there were many obstacles in the way of real world environmental management. And I think you heard an example of that this morning uh, from Sarah about all galleries are not created equal. Those who care for cultural heritage collections are usually not scientists. They are practical people with varied expertise and many different responsibilities. We turned our attention to the problems of creating models and tools for use by collection care professionals, architects, and engineers. The purpose of these devices, algorithms, and software products was to make it easier to measure, organize, and analyze temperature and relative humidity data. Without data, there can be no environmental management and no basis for decisions. The problems of data gathering, which is just the first step in environmental management, are often underestimated. It seems so simple in the age of electronic data loggers and modern buildings hardwired with sensors linked to building management automation systems to know what conditions the collections are experiencing. It seems very simple to do that. But in practice, we have discovered, and perhaps you have as well, it is far from simple. IPI has designed and built two generations of battery-powered temperature and relative humidity recording devices. The current model is called the Preservation Environment Monitor 2, or PEM2, we call it for short. It is in use in more than 1,000 institutions worldwide. And uh, this is the PEM2 right here. We decided to create this device as part of a system whose goal it is to make it as easy as possible for cultural heritage collections to gather data and use it intelligently for preservation and sustainable environmental management. The principal design features of the PEM2 reflect this goal, to get continuous, accurate data to a place where it can be stored, organized, and analyzed. And I might say those are the, some of the main reasons why it's not so simple to gather and use data effectively in environmental management, because you have to store it, you have to organize it, and you have to ultimately decide what it means. And what is that place? What kinds of data analysis best serve the needs of preventive conservation and sustainable environmental management? What do you do with the data, in other words? After a number of years of developing desktop 
and web software, we are convinced that a web, or if you want to call it a cloud, that's the fancy way for talking about a web-based software program, a cloud application is the most practical. IPI has created such an application, www.eclimatenotebook.com. And here you see the front page of that web application. There are many advantages to a web-based software for this purpose. Data is secure and automatically backed up. Every user always runs the latest version of the software with no upgrades needed. Performance is fast. Access to data and reports is controlled via passwords, but available to building operators, curators, collection managers, anyone who needs it. IPI has spent many years working on software tools for organization and analysis of temperature and RH data. Organization, naming and dividing sets of data based on location, collection type, and the type of materials present is one of the most important tasks in environmental management. And the larger the institution, the more important this aspect becomes. And perhaps one of the best examples we have of that a large institution has large data organization and data management problems is the National Museum of Denmark. And you can see here a portion of their account on Climate Notebook where um, each one of these uh, lines is, is really uh, a pointer to a building or a whole collection unit. Uh, altogether, there are more than 275 data sets in this one uh, organization's account. Um, Once we know from where the data is gathered, know the nature of collections and as much as possible about the circumstances that influence the collections, influence the conditions surrounding the collections, we can begin to do real environmental management. There are two main problems, deciding whether and to what degree the conditions are beneficial or harmful to the collections, and secondly, deciding whether there is a more sustainable way to manage the environment, and if so, how much risk does it pose to collections? And that's precisely what Sarah was talking about this morning with the MFA Boston's uh, one ACA uh, or LCA uh, on um, the gallery shutdowns. For some institutions and collections, environmental analysis and management are very straightforward. There is an established target temperature and relative humidity with narrow fluctuations allowed to be maintained day and night throughout the year. This approach is appropriate for a few institutions, but impossible for many because their outdoor climate, building envelope, or mechanical systems will not permit. It has the advantage of simplicity. It's very simple to manage such an environment. <laughs> but it's very difficult from a sustainability point of view. It prejudges the question of whether the targets are beneficial or harmful for every type of object that may be present. Analysis, though, is truly simple. You are either in the target zone or not. Institutions that follow this approach tend to have more separation of function and less dialogue between building operators those kinds of people that are referred to in the UK as estates managers and that we call in the USA facilities managers or facilities staff and conservators. So if this is the way you manage your environment in a straight line fashion, it doesn't tend to encourage dialogue between the people who create the environment and the conservators who look out for the health of the objects that are in the environment. However, in the majority of cultural heritage collections, there is both a lack of clarity about the most beneficial environment for collections preservation and the potential for an impact of steps taken to reduce energy consumption or minimize global environmental impact. In other words, in the real world, there's a lot more confusion 
about how good or bad the conditions are for the collections, really, and uh, whether or not there's a more sustainable way to manage them. In fact, in most places, there is complexity in abundance with a need for expertise that transcends what an architect, conservator, curator, or building engineer may individually know. At IPI, we have tried to create algorithms that help analyze temperature and RH data for possible harm or benefit to collections. We call these algorithms preservation metrics and have built them into the eClima Notebook web software. They operate on the observed temperature and humidity readings gathered over time and provide standardized quantitative estimates of how environmental conditions influence some important types of collection decay. One metric, time-weighted preservation index, or TWPI, is a general treatment of the kinetics of decay in organic materials. It estimates the rate of spontaneous chemical change. Others deal with the risk of mold growth and the potential for mechanical damage due to extremes of dampness and dryness, absorption and desorption of moisture. And I show you an example of how these metrics actually might be used. This is a real-world example. This is an archive that happens to be present in Atlanta, Georgia. And these were the conditions that they were achieving. Here are the preservation <coughs> metrics. There is a summary in very easy to understand words of the risks from these potential forms of deterioration, natural aging, meaning chemical change in organic materials, the risk of mold, metal corrosion, or mechanical damage due to cracking, swelling, shrinking, etc. Then here are the numerical values in which these ratings are based on, and then here is just some of the, the, the raw data, the temperature, the RH, and the dew point means and start and end date. So in this one little summary, you have some important information that is created for you automatically about the impact of the conditions. This TWPI is in red, and it means that organic materials are aging, in, are aging faster in these conditions than they should be. And this particular archive installed um, some rather fancy new uh, climate control equipment on the roof, and it really dramatically changed the quality of the environment that um, they have. And here are the, after a year of operating with this new system, um, the rate of spontaneous chemical change has al almost tripled. There is certainly no risk of mold. There's no risk of metal corrosion. And there's even less risk before of mechanical damage. And so these numbers here, the metrics, help justify the $800,000 cost of that system. And they really help in the day-to-day -day management of it. And I would say to you that, as I've said to them, as the consultant to this organization, that they've made it better. Their next step is to make it more sustainable, to learn to keep these good conditions even while using less energy. The metrics are not object-specific, by the way. They describe the environment. You have to know the degree to which chemical change, metal corrosion, dampness, or dryness pose a threat to your particular collection objects. In practice, most environmental managers worry about all these forms of deterioration and more. The power and usefulness of the metrics is that they begin the analysis process with a standardized set of numbers that both warn of potential danger and serve to document when incremental improvements are made, as you just saw. Experienced analysts, let me go back one. Well, no. <laughs> Experienced analysts examine graphs of raw temperature and relative humidity data, as well as the preservation metrics, of course. Of course, we look at the raw data as well. But the metrics help answer the question, are we getting the best environment we can with the least use of energy and resources? You have to add the resource measurement piece 
to the evaluations in order to optimize both the environment for the collection and the energy consumption. IPI is continuing both its laboratory research and field consulting practice in sustainable environmental management. In the laboratory, as you see here, we are exploring how rates of thermal and moisture equilibration can be used to advantage in lowering energy consumption or protecting objects from uncontrolled adverse conditions. Beyond the laboratory, we have helped institutions use less energy through controlled shutdowns of mechanical systems, altering seasonal set points, reducing air flows, and reducing outside air quantities. One thing is abundantly clear. The path forward for sustainable environmental management is cross-disciplinary in nature. Buildings, collections, machinery, psychrometric relationships, and mechanical system design, and maintenance, the maintenance people are very important, are far too much for any one person to master. We all must learn from each other to make progress. And the last thought I would leave you with is that sustainable, sustainability in environmental management is very much a team sport. No, it can't be done alone. It is cross-disciplinary, and that is the way to make progress. Thank you very much. So I guess that we have uh, time for, let's say, uh, five, five questions maximum. So we have time, I think, for five questions maximum. Stefan would like to uh, come up too. Some of the questions, maybe for him. Oh, 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 oh okay. He says only if necessary. No, he doesn't have a question. He might have to answer a question. But there's no questions for me, so. Maybe Stefan has a question. Yeah, <laughs> please. Qui a des questions? Tout était très clair, alors. Non, Gaël. Merci beaucoup pour votre intervention. J'aimerais savoir si ce que vous avez fait dans le domaine des films peut être fait dans d'autres domaines. Okay, I understand your question, even in French. <laughs> I was speaking English. Huh? But with a French accent. I thought you were Italian. <laughs> you are pretty right. <laughs> um, well, the question is, I think, is what, let me explain what I thought I understood from your question is, um, Certain elements of, for example, the time-weighted preservation index are based on film data and uh, reflect hydrolysis of organic materials and the, and the in relative combined influence over time of temperature and relative humidity. The other metrics, uh, are, you know, mold is, uh, we base mold partly on work that's the mold metric partly on published work of others, including Stefan. Um, the work, uh, the metric for expansion and contraction related damage is um, based on uh, work by the U.S. Forest Products Laboratory and using the behavior of wood as an indicator of uh, hygroscopic materials that are likely to uh, undergo expansion and contraction related deterioration. What, what, what I think the, the real answer uh, to what you're asking is that what we try to do is not to uh, not to be so object specific but to give the environmental manager a set of easily understood uh, numbers calculated in a standardized way that get you started in understanding what the nature of potential environmental risks may be Perhaps you have nothing in your collection where mold might grow. Perhaps it's all very clean titanium sculptures. 
So mold may not be the, or metal corrosion may not be issues for you, but um, they would be for other people. And trying to create software where temperature and humidity data, which is useful in so many contexts, temperature and humidity data can be easily collected because people don't have much time, can be stored, organized, and put through this I would say beginning set of algorithms. That is very useful in environmental management. And the kinds of experiences that we've had uh, is that not only for film and not only for paper and archives, but for all sorts of collections, having a feeling for those sort of general f forms of deterioration and not just a feeling, but a quantitative estimate, is very handy. It's a very good starting place. Um, the difficulty is you have to know the vulnerabilities of your own collection. You have to know what form of deterioration you're most concerned with. It might be different for a rare book collection or a general library collection or a, a fine art collection or a decorative arts collection. But actually, our experience is that um, for those people who have to think about and manage the storage climate, it really provides a, a good uh, estimate of risk. And as we all know, and you'll hear m more about this tomorrow and in other days, those people who deal with environment know that, that, risk is, that risks um, multiply quickly at the very dry in the very damp end of the relative humidity scale, and that they multiply when temperature is elevated. And so what you do about it is another story, but the first thing you have to, to, uh, to start with is, uh, well, how approximately how good or bad is this environment for this type of collection? That's a long answer, but it, it, it's, the answer is it's more broadly useful <clears throat> than just for film. It works well for lots of other materials and other collections. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank, thank you very much. Any other questions? I, I would like to have uh, one <laughs> well, <laughs> question. Um, comment, en fait, la, la numérisation des croissantes des contenus et euh, même la production euh, de contenu numérique euh, influe-t-elle sur les politiques et les stratégies de préservation In another way, I can also uh, <laughs> say it in English, in, in which way the digitization of contents and even the uh, increasing production of native digital documents uh, does influence preservation politics and strategies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, preservation politics and strategies. Uh, I can tell you the way. I'll answer for myself, personally. <clears throat> and my personal opinion is that <clears throat> the, the two worlds of, of traditional preservation of, of physical materials, and on the other hand, the preservation of digital files, fichier numérique, they're such a, they're very different activities requiring different knowledge and specializations. And when it comes to digital preservation, preservation of digital files, I think that the relevant skills and background are nearly all in uh, informatics, in information technology. And so um, the answers are to be found there. The answers are not ever independent of the technology. You have to use digital technology to interact with digital collections. And therefore, the people who organize and, and direct the digital technology of the moment, the path forward is to make them relate to the problem of long-term survival of the files, more than they already do with, of course, they, they always speak about backup and, and uh, migration and uh, d multiplication, the you know, different copies here and there. And, but still, I think it's fundamentally a different skill set. 
and, and speaking for myself and for the Image Permanence Institute, um, we didn't feel like we had much to offer in that way um, because uh, we had a staff whose skills and background was primarily in the physical. Um, but as we create more websites and more, more software, uh, maybe we, we have acquired more expertise in, in, in that world of informatics. But um, I think they're very different. The politics of preservation is another story. Uh, the practice is one story. The other story is the politics. Uh, as we all know, we all, every one of us, are, are living through this incredible age of interacting with uh, all these digital devices. Take a ride on the Paris Metro, and you're holding your phone, and so is everyone else. And everyone is doing research in that way, except for the top tier of research libraries. Uh, where you must consult the originals. So it, it's a digital world. And um, there's a great deal of interest from top administrators in collections on digital preservation. But no one has terribly good answers about that. That's a good question. <laughs> As they say in Italy, una bella demanda. It's a very good question to say, well, what about preservation of files and what are the politics? The politics are that Lots of resources are going there towards uh, digital uh, file preservation, but no one's quite sure that they're making the right choices. Right now, our community, the community of concern about preservation, is struggling to use, to create its own tools to even understand what long-term preservation is. And it's very, very difficult. It was never so humbling for me. I was called over by the archivist of my university. And she said, oh, you publish a newsletter at the Image Permanence Institute called Climate Notes. And um, it's a good one. We like to preserve it. But I have no way of preserving it and because it doesn't exist on paper. So even in my own university, and I said, she said, what should I do? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> So it's a, it's a problem. Good question. Thank you very much. What a last question. Une dernière question. Merci beaucoup. Just a last question. Wait one moment, please. Oh. Maybe there, there's another question. Just just wait a minute. I thought I was please. done. <laughs> this last remark, I just uh, uh, have a, a remark. In digital domain, we always have a career support to magnetic tapes, uh, hard disk, and optical disk, for instance. Just uh, this uh, remark. We don't forget, we always have a career. Always have. A oh, you a always have a physical. Support. You always have a physical medium mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. Yeah, but um, in the in the field is my understanding that they um, they don't trust any physical medium <laughs> for long term survival because of the problem of hardware and software obsolescence, and um, because of the constant need for um, error checking and refreshing and migration. Uh, so they, um, as far as I know, um, there's a lot of people who are relying in a practical way on media such as uh, uh, optical disc or LTD tapes, uh, magnetic tapes. And um, that's the way that, for example, Sony Bertelsmann uh, does it. But um, in general, I mean, to, to look at that and look at the costs of, of uh, 
serious data preservation, um, it's a bit disheartening and a bit, uh, I think I feel nervous for those in institutions that would rely on just, on just the survival of a medium, a physical medium like optical disc or a, uh, uh, a playback availability uh, or emulation of one software by another. Um, I, I think those are, those are, they make me nervous. But you're right, there is always a physical medium somewhere. The cloud is not really made of water vapor. <laughs> it's made of things. So, but there has, it's, yeah, anyway, I think I answered your question, or tried. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>